You're listening to the Hayek Program Podcast. This podcast includes audio from lectures, interviews, and discussions from scholars and visitors of the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. To learn more about the Hayek Program, visit hayek.mercatus.org. To learn about graduate student fellowship opportunities with the Mercatus Center at George Mason University for students at Mason as well as at universities across the globe, please visit students.mercatus.org. Uh, Lauren Lemaski is the, I'm going to do the introductions uh, first here, uh, is the Corey Professor of Political Philosophy, Policy, and Law and the Director of the Political Philosophy, Policy, and Law Program at University of Virginia. He's best known for his work, Persons, Rights, and Moral Community. Uh, for those of us who are uh, in the public choice vein, uh, Lauren also is uh, famous for writing a book called Democracy and Decision, uh, which developed the notion of expressive voting uh, in a serious way, along with Jeff Brennan. Uh, Lauren, before uh, teaching uh, at University of Virginia, uh, taught at Bowling Green uh, University, and before that at University of Minnesota Duluth. Um, so uh, with that, I will turn it over to Lauren, uh, and then you have 15 minutes to present, and then we'll go across the board there. And I guess since the way you're sitting, we'll go exactly the way that you're seated there, okay? All right, so let's get started. I probably shouldn't ask, but what would you do if I took 17 minutes? <laughs> Charge you. What are the incentives? <laughs> well, all right, go. <laughs> See, I wouldn't ask that if I were in my usual environment. I'm a philosopher. Uh, I'm uh, an unusual beast in this particular zoo, but it's one that I always appreciate coming to. George Mason, to me, is one of the most interesting places that I ever get to visit. Of course, maybe if I had a life, it would be different. But, um, <laughs> but I will tell you that uh, I'm quite sure that on my visits here, I always derive more benefits than I impart. Um, philosopher might say that's unjust. Your economists deal with it. <laughs> so uh, uh, in order to make sure that this holds true, and I do get more benefit than you do, I'm going to try to be quite brief here. Normally, if I stand up, I don't stop talking for 15 minutes. Uh, but I will keep within the 15 today, because you scared me. Um, I want to say a little bit about the project of this book. It's to offer a theory of global justice. Hasn't that been done before, you might ask? Uh, and the answer is yes, but um, my co-author, Fernando Tesson, who um, uh, I'm sure he wishes that he could be here. Uh, he's in Florida, and he's done talks in um, uh, New Orleans and in Texas, whereas I've gotten uh, uh, the northern part of the country. Uh, I'm not sure why it worked out that way. But uh, uh, most of the literature in philosophy, and I can't speak to other fields, most of the literature on global justice has basically viewed the issue as, well, imagine a chessboard representing the countries of the world. And on some, you have a very high pile of gold coins. Uh, let's make it gold in honor of uh, the setting. And, uh, uh, <laughs> And then on other squares, you have a low pile of maybe uh, tarnished copper. And um, in those places in which the, the wealth is piled high, people tend to live longer, healthier, happier lives uh, in which their prospects, that of their children, etc., cetera, is, um, is pretty uh, enviable. On the others, there are uh, most 
people who are scrambling for subsistence, if lucky, and often not even that. Um, they die younger and sicker. Well, I guess if you die, you're equally sick with anybody else who dies. I mean, that's dead, but you understand <laughs> what I mean. Along the way, not so pleasant. Uh, their, uh, their ability to partake of some of life's goods is less than anybody in this room. And uh, they're, they probably care for their children as much as your mom and dad cared for you, but uh, uh, often are unable to provide for them what they would like. Isn't this unfair? Doesn't it almost leap out at us saying uh, something ought to be done about this? And in the global justice literature, what is done here, what's advocated, is you take some of the coins that are piled up high and comfortable and move them to those who have little. That is to say, the issue of global justice or rather global injustice is one of wrongful distribution. So what's called for is redistribution. If this leads you to think about uh, John Rawls's theory, well, yeah, that's part of what uh, theorists have brought up. If it leads you to think of utilitarians like Peter Singer, yeah, that's another strand of it. But basically, the idea is that from those who have much more be taken to give to those who have little. Now, I want to come back to this in a bit, but uh, let me just say that this book does not proceed with that as the starting point. That's more like the concluding point. Um, there's more to justice than just distributive or redistributive justice. We can talk about the difference if you'd like. Uh, but in the tradition to, of which I'm heir and to which I'm partial, uh, justice involves respect for individuals' rights. What kind of rights? Well, my boss at UVA uh, phrased it as to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Probably those of you in an economics program wish he had just followed John Locke and said property instead. But, you know, he didn't. But he became president. Good luck for you trying to do that. Um, so uh, what we thought we ought to do is at least begin thinking about global justice in terms of whether individuals' rights to the integrity of their, their bodies, their lives, their stuff is respected. And if it isn't, that's a signal injustice. That is to say, to provide a genuinely <coughs> liberal theory of global justice. Now, it might surprise you, but I think that before we wrote this, you know, <coughs> basically did not have a, a niche in this particular literature. But of course, um, that's a philosophy literature, and I've been learning in my short time here today that economists have said other things that um, that are really useful in this regard, and that's part of what I mean by saying that I benefit more coming up here than I provide to others. But that's a that's a, a, a digression. Um, if it's the case that these vast disparities in well-being are due to genuine rights violations, then there really is a strong case to be made that the uneven chessboard manifests great injustice across the globe. My co-author and I, after examining this, uh, come to the conclusion 
yes, that's right. Uh, that glo that injustices of great disparities of wealth versus streams of poverty are unjust, and that these injustices can be identified not simply in terms of these outcomes, but the inputs to this, what brings it about, and that uh, the world's poor have been uh, hard done by. <laughs> Not, however, by the usual culprits who are hauled out at Millennium Conferences and in the pages of the social justice theorists, but overwhelmingly by their own governments and institutions. Um, if you if you do even a cursory examination of the really unfortunate um, environment in the world, overwhelmingly uh, those who suffer these burdens are the are victimized by domestic forces. Um, some are obvious. How could North Korea, say, not be on such a list? But, but uh, even in, in countries that you know, are not quite so horrific, uh, violations of liberty and you know, life are manifest. Now, we can go into details of this later if you want. Uh, but let me turn away from that to us, to, and uh, by the way, in this literature, when the first person plural is used, we have a duty always. It means uh, citizens or governments of wealthy Western countries, especially, of course, the United States. Uh, are we um, complicit in injustices done? across borders? And the answer, I'm afraid, is yes. Yes, we are. It is a gross mistake to suppose that we are the primary perpetrators, but we make that situation worse, that, um, that the misery of the world's least well-off at the margin, it, oh, I love being around a place where I could say at the margin, uh, <laughs> is enhanced by uh, the policies of OECD countries and the like. Uh, in this book, we talk about several ways in which that's true. Let me just mention maybe three of them. There are others that could go into also. One concerns harms done by uh, restrictive trade policy. We believe that uh, capitalistic acts between consenting adults, as Robert Nozick put in in his wonderful thread, uh, involves a, uh, a just liberty of all peoples, and that's true whether or not these acts cross borders. And so restrictions on trade, things like, you know, like quotas, uh, uh, tariffs, and so on, are by their very nature unjust. Um, and so, for example, to the extent that, uh, that we hold up such barriers that, yep, uh, this constitutes an injustice. Now, of course, as you know, just recently a pretty significant trade pact uh, was uh, realized, well, was uh, agreed to, whether it will be signed off um, by all parties, across the Pacific remains to be seen. Um, I thought at the time this was probably a good thing to do, but then I saw that it was rejected by both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. And what are the chances that they could both be wrong about an important <laughs> issue? Uh, um, now, I might have to rethink this, but before that happened, my view was that this, this is the sort of, the sort of uh, intrusion 
uh, uh, others that we ought to be kind of ashamed of. Um, okay. Second, talk about aid. Um, uh, since the war, and I mean since World War II, uh, uh, large amounts of resources have indeed been transferred from, uh, from global haves to global have-nots. And I understand that among the experts in the field, there's a significant debate as to whether unbalanced this has done good. Some say, yeah. It really has. Others say no more harm than good. Well, I'm not so interested in that, but the fact that even, you know, with these very large sums um, have been transferred, there's even a debate as to whether it's produced value is the real salient point here. Um, note, though, that these sorts of transfers are not uh, compassionate gifts from those who have to those who don't, but they too are coercively extracted from some to others. Uh, maybe coercive extraction to avert genuine harms and to really uh, provide notable goods, so maybe it's justifiable, but in cases where even whether I'm balanced it's a benefit, this too is illiberal in the old-fashioned sense of this. Finally, let me mention uh, to uh, people moving not goods and services, but their bodies across barriers, restrictions on mobility. It's one of you know, the great injustices that liberals from Locke to Adam Smith to people in this room have uh, have uh, uh, criticized, and yet uh, we find that, you know, we take this routine that people crossing borders can be properly stopped by governmental officials from doing so based on their policy determination. Look, we would think that's outrageous if when you wanted, anybody come here today from Maryland? No one? Oh, that's pathetic. I need another example. Anybody come here today? Well, you get the idea. If anybody here ever go to Maryland? <laughs> Great. All right. When you cross that border, do they stop you, check your visa, ask you if, what business you're about? You know, we would find, we would find state Border. This is smaller state, I guess, uh, that are used in this way to stop people from going to school, seeing their friends, even taking a job. We would find it intolerable. Well, it becomes more tolerable uh, across national borders. It's kind of taken for granted, or maybe not so much taken for granted, but a prime occasion for demagoguery. Now, uh, normally that would be the case since this is now turning into a presidential year. Uh, public figures are more measured and prudent in their statements, and so would not dream of uh, appealing to the basest emotions of the citizenry. But if they did, they would... Uh, did somebody really suggest a wall at the Mexican border would be a good idea? Or was that just a Saturday Night Live skit? Uh, yeah, well, you get the idea uh, that, uh, <coughs> that restrictions on individual mobility are alive and well in our public discourse. And this, too, is something that we take issue with. Um, I think events of recent weeks have fueled this issue, well, the, thinking especially of the latest massacre in Paris, and unfortunately one has to say the latest massacre, because you know the Charlie Hebdo one 
for a while seemed to be pretty big stuff until, until it got displaced by the events of, what is it now, three weeks ago. But uh, this has produced an enormous amount of um, meritorious comment. And I think that, uh, well, this would be an interesting thing to talk about. Let me just say one thing about this. One, one uh, eventuality I find um, really negative is that it's very common now to distinguish between genuine asylum seekers, refugees, and mere economic migrants. Now, maybe I'm preaching to the choir here, uh, but uh, why economic migrant would be a pejorative strikes me as bizarre. After all, refu you, know, you should feel sorry for refugees. They're fleeing from something. But an economic migrant is somebody who, uh, who is moving to something, to a valued outcome. And... Uh, that this should be a second class uh, form of activity, I think is um, pretty discouraging. But I think I've got uh, many, many more things I'd like to say, but I think I'll stop here so I can listen to, to, my, uh, to the commenters and to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Hayek Program podcast. To learn more about the research, scholars, and work of the Hayek Program, visit hayek.mercatus.org. For more information about graduate student fellowship opportunities for students at Mason, as well as at universities across the globe, please visit students.mercatus.org. We hope you recommend students to our programs or consider applying yourself.